Welcome to our annual, or at least every semester, town meeting. Uh, for those of you who are new and haven't uh, been to one of these before, we do these at the beginning of every semester, and we go through uh, sort of a laundry list of overview topics for the school so that when you leave here today, you should have a pretty good overview of everything that's going on from the academic to the financial to things that are in between. Now, there's a lot of material to present, so I'm going to go through this very quickly. In fact, it seems like every year we grow, we have more things going on, we have more influence, we have more alumni, so there are more things to report. So I'm not going to read the slides, I'm going to simply uh, talk about a couple of items on them as you go. Okay? And since we're an engineering school, you'll find that we have graphs and charts too, so that you'll feel right at home like you're taking a class. Okay? And there'll be a test at the end. Um, so, first of all, welcome. There are a lot of new members of our community, uh, new faculty members, staff members, students, and so forth. And I won't ask everybody to stand up. Uh, I'll just welcome you all at once here, and we'll go right along. Uh, first of all, since we met in February, there's a lot of things that have been going on right here on campus, which we refer to as inside the Oval. Uh, some of you may remember this sort of cool picture, which happened with our first five-year reunion when we brought our alumni back and asked them what they would like to do. Guess what? They wanted to repeat Candidates Weekend, except this time for alumni. Um, there's some congratulations in order. There are a number of things happened in the spring where folks' job positions changed somewhat. You can see we had a very productive uh, um, promotion process for our faculty. There are a lot of new full professors and some associate professors there. Uh, we have a new associate vice president and new corporate relations director. Um, so I think we should take a moment and congratulate everybody who's been promoted. In addition to this, um, we've had some more kinds of congratulations. Besides uh, promotions and position, we've had people who, who've achieved great things that have brought um, new resources and new opportunities to the school and uh, new materials. You can see some new books that were written. We have four new grants totaling almost a million dollars in new research that's going on. Um, this is really terrific. And we had uh, every year at the end of the year, Students might not be aware of this because it's after commencement. We have a special luncheon in which we recognize staff. And one of the things that we recognize is people who've been here for a long time. Um, Ten years of service, you know, five years of service, and then we um, have an election um, process that involves finding a, a staff member who was singled out for their extraordinary service above and beyond the call. And this year it was Claire O'Sullivan. So at any rate, this all happened since last February. Um, alumni have been out doing terrific things too. For example, um, at sea level, we had a group of students who competed in the international sailbot competition in Vancouver, BC, and they came in second place internationally. And in the process, by the way, they beat two teams from the US Naval Academy. And they did this on their very first time out. We also have uh, quite an alum, it's a student, who will graduate soon, who at 29,000 feet topped Mount Everest. Now this is the first Olin alum to do that, and I've talked about this in a couple of other institutions. There are a lot of our sister institutions that are very old compared to Olin that don't have a single alum that's been to 29,000 feet. <laughs> um, some of our other alumni have been doing great things as well. You might recognize um, um, some of the faculty and staff who've been here for a while will recognize this young lady, uh, Polina Segalova, who was one of our Olin partners, and she graduated from Stanford with her PhD um, recently. So we have one of our juniors who's named for the Kleiner Perkins uh, Fellowship uh, Program out in Silicon Valley. Um, NSF fellowships, Fulbright scholarships, we've become so used to these now that they hardly seem like news and we forget to celebrate them with the people that do them each year. Um, we also had a, an awful lot of effort devoted last year to strategic planning. And I want to tell you how that's come out. 
uh, the board has approved the plan, and we're still working on the implementation. Exactly how will the how will this affect the way we make decisions on new in, new employment, new uh, deployment of resources, and so forth. The mission of the school has changed somewhat. So our vision is to lead a transformation of undergraduate engineering education in America and throughout the world. We have to be the leader in order to make our vision come true, and we expect to be recognized for that leadership role. The kind of recognition I'm talking about here has much less to do with getting awards or being identified in news media. It has to do with being recognized by corporations who will plan to invest in us as opposed to the other institutions out there and enable us to hire more faculty and, to, and more staff in order to expand our influence in education. That's what I mean by recognition. We have three priorities, um, which we talked about last spring in the auditorium, so I won't go over them now. And of course, it's approved by the trustees in May, in the, and there's work going on now in terms of implementation. Okay, um, in terms of the academic program, we've had some changes here, too. Um, you've already seen that we have uh, three associate deans and not one. Uh, and we have three areas here that are identified as well. Um, Faculty Affairs and Development, Associate Dean for External Engagements and Initiatives, and Curriculum and Academic Programs. That sort of covers the waterfront of what's going on in the academic program. Uh, we have some new full-time faculty members, uh, one of whom, those of you who've been on this campus for a while will recognize, um, Juliana Burnell Ostos was a student here, graduated in 07, so this is her fifth, um, uh, you know, uh, anniversary. Uh, and we also have some familiar faces returning as part-time faculty. We have a lot of part-time faculty, but these folks are special because they're essentially part of the family from years ago. Um, I won't embarrass them by asking them to stand up, even though I can see some of them in the audience right now. Um, the themes for this year in the academic program align quite well with the new associate dean positions. And there's a lot of curricular innovation underway, uh, as you can see. Uh, the sustainability certificate is going to have uh, the first person complete it at this year. We have some changes in the entrepreneurship program. Rob Martello, the Wizard of Oz, is out doing his thing at Wellesley now as well. So another new course. Um, Reaccreditation. The ABET accreditation process is underway. What is ABET? Uh, it used to stand for the Accreditation Board for Engineering and Technology. It's the um, board that looks at the quality of all of the engineering programs in North America, and it makes sure that if you enroll in one of these things, that when you get your degree at the end, it's recognized by all of the other institutions, including employers. We've been through this process once before. All of our programs are currently accredited. They're coming back again because every six years or so, you have to go through this again. They'll be on our campus soon. The main thing that you need to know is that there will be visitors from other institutions walking around. They will want to talk with you, students, faculty, and staff, and they will ask you all kinds of questions about the school. I hope you will simply be honest with them. Tell them what you see, what you think is good, what you think needs to be improved. They're here to help us. Okay? That's the main message. Um, now, we also have something new that we didn't have a year ago. We have a, um, a chief marketing officer and a new, uh, new effort underway, which is very organized, to provide marketing and communications under one roof. And the, um, the new person who's joined us is here this morning, um, Michelle Davis. I'm going to embarrass you and ask you to stand up for a second just so that everybody can see you. We are delighted to have her on our team because she's going to help us to accelerate the reputation of Olin among many key constituencies. Those of us who've been here for a long time, and I think even students, um, have been frustrated with trying to explain to the rest of the world what Olin is and why you chose to go here. I mean, in the early days, when students left to go home from Candidates Weekend, we gave them a t-shirt, and on the back of the t-shirt it said, we never heard of your school either. 
Um, when we try to explain what Olin is about, it's always difficult because it has to do with the culture. So now we have a czar of explanations on our team, and she's going to help us improve the way we explain what we're doing. So we're delighted to have you, Michelle. Thank you. Um, admission. We're off and running already. We already have quite a few students who have, or prospective students who have begun the process of filling out their applications. Um, we're ahead of last year in terms of the number of application files that have been started on the internet at this point in time. Of course, this is like watching a, a horse race immediately as they get out of the gate. We have a long ways to go. Um, all of you know that, but we're hoping that, we'll, that our number of applications will increase. Um, what happened to our graduates who left last May? That's only four months ago. It turns out that 91% of them are either employed or they're in graduate school at this point in time. And of course, there are 9% who we believe have intentionally deferred starting their career where they're doing some other things, including Fulbrights and international travel, or just looking around. Uh, really quite a good outcome given the uh, overall economy and the concern these days about unemployment in America. Um, now, let me switch to the financial situation. The chart that you see on the right is a graph of the total number of dollars that we spend each year since uh, 2006 which was the first year we had full enrollment here on the college. Before that, we didn't have the full program in place. The total number of dollars that we spend from the endowment in order to pay for the operations. And the big message, of course, is that this number is dropping. In fact, this past year, fiscal year 12, which ended on June 30th, uh, we spent less money from the endowment than we've ever spent. This actually is good news, all right? When you're worried about uh, sustaining the program for indefinite periods of time, being able to keep the money in the bank account is much better than seeing how fast you can deplete it. Okay? Uh, we have to be careful about how fast we spend from this endowment because it's going to pay for the tuition scholarships for the students who will be here 20, 30, and 40 years from now. And that's important. Um, so one of the pieces of good news is that the rate at which we've had to spend from the endowment has declined. Um, secondly, we've made some changes in the way we manage the endowment. We've chosen another endowment manager. And the reason why we did that, these two things, by the way, are the kinds of things that Olin has control over in the financial world. But the things that aren't so good are the things that we don't have control over, one of which being the fact that the endowment itself, investment returns, were not positive this year. They were negative. A lot of other schools also had negative returns, but we were quite disappointed in this, and this led us to make a change in the firm that we have hired to manage our endowment. That's the button up above. And finally, uh, with the combined spending from the endowment and the low returns, the actual value of the endowment on June 30th of 2012 was lower than the actual value of the endowment on June 30th, 2011. That's the first time that's happened in a long time. And uh, this is a cause for us to see a yellow light on the dashboard. Okay? Here's another way of looking at it for those of you engineers in the crowd who much rather see things in a graph. Um, we have two graphs up here. The, the old timers in the audience are very used to this, but I know we have some new people. Uh, the blue line is the actual value of our endowment quarter by quarter as you march through the years past. The red line is what's called the 12 quarter trailing average. So that value will be the average of the 12 points that preceded it. Okay? That's what happens. Um, so, why, what's the, de the deal with the uh, red line? Turns out that the red line is what determines how much money we can safely spend from the endowment each year, and therefore not have to charge tuition and so forth in order to move forward. Um, we want the red line to be as high as we can get it. The red line is actually just determined by the blue line. So the easy way to think of it, we're happy when the blue line is above the red line, okay? Because it's pulling the red one up slowly. It's gaining altitude. And we were doing okay. By the way, you can see the recession hit, right? 
this is like 2008, we began these auditorium talks with this graph in the fall of 2008, and we were watching these numbers unfold, okay? We, were, we felt good when it reached that bottom and started going up again. We felt the recession has bottomed out. And then we thought, well, maybe it's a double dip recession. And then we thought, a triple dip recession. Maybe there's four dips in this recession, <laughs> okay? And a lot of other people are thinking the same thing, and you can just turn on the TV and listen to the ads for the campaigns for the next presidential election. Everybody's worried about this same thing. Okay, if that blue line were up there, we would be a lot happier. There's much we can do about that at this point in time other than to plan. So what we've done is to go back and look at the financial sustainability model that was created during the last financial crisis by the Board of Trustees. And what did they say? They said the school will be financially sustainable if the endowment value rebounds as all of the wizards on Wall Street told us that it would after about two or three uh, extra quarters because this is a bigger recession than usual. It will turn around and go back up. Unfortunately, the endowment value has not rebounded as the models predicted. And this has caused us to scratch our heads a little bit. At this point in time, all it means is that the board is going to be spending more time watching this, monitoring this, maybe come up with some recommendations. And within the school, we're going to all have to be a little more concerned about spending uh, from our budgets. It's better to be a little bit cautious than it is to be a little, little bit aggressive when you get this kind of news. Um, so if we're not, what could happen, we might face some budget reductions in the future. We've been really fortunate in the way we went through the last um, financial crisis. In fact, that how fortunate we were became pretty clear when we looked around us and saw other institutions and how they're dealing with it. For example, Cooper Union. How many people know about Cooper Union? Okay, do you know that it's going through a financial crisis? Uh, big time, okay? Um, Cooper Union is a special partner for us because it's one of the only other schools on the planet that offers very large merit-based scholarships. And they do that because they also have a large endowment and they depend on that endowment to produce the revenue that otherwise they would have to charge people for. And they've discovered that that model is not working for them. And so they're going through a whole period of rethinking what they can afford and what they can't afford in this whole business of future budget reduction. So if you want to get scared tonight, go on the internet and find out what's happening at Cooper Union, and then let's do what we can to keep that from happening here. Okay? What does that mean? As the year progresses, if you have some extra money in your budget that you thought you were going to need to spend that you didn't actually spend yet, don't spend it. Save it. It might be useful. That's the message. Okay, on the more good news side, this is what's been happening since our development team has been on the ground. And it's almost scary to me how linear this thing looks. In fact, it's almost to the point where it raises some suspicions um, whether there's something else going on here. Um, at any rate, I think it's kind of interesting to know that in 2008, right about in here, is when Tom joined us and his crew, and they've been uh, working hard ever since, and look at the numbers going up. By the way, if you looked at the amount of total dollars received from development at many other colleges in the country during the same period in time, it wouldn't look like this. The national average in terms of giving to colleges and universities during this recession has not been positive. There have been years when, in fact, it's negative percentage change from one year to the next. Ours has had about a 40% growth in each year. So this is all positive. I claim if we stay on this 40% per year growth pattern, <laughs> sooner or later, this is going to make a difference in our budget. Um, some good news in just the last few months. Um, $1.3 million gift from the Argosy Foundation, which is really the private family foundation of a good friend of Olin's, John Abley. Uh, John is the founder of Boston Scientific. He's been retired for a long time. He's very involved with the FIRST robotics program. Those of you who know about FIRST, 
John has been a supporter of that from the beginning, in fact, chairman of the board for many years. In addition to that, uh, Sun Lin Cho, who is one of our trustees, a former executive at Intel Corporation, has made a second commitment of about half a million dollars to the school. This one, to provide need-based scholarship funds for international students. This will be beginning very soon. And um, Larry Milas, a name that you might have heard before, like on the door as you walk in this building, um, has told us that he has changed his estate plans so that eventually Olin will inherit money capable of providing at least one, we believe several, full cost of attendance merit-based scholarships um, as we go forward. So this is really doing what they can to restore the full tuition scholarship for Olin. In fact, Larry Miles goes beyond the full tuition scholarship. This is a full cost of attendance scholarship, including room and board and every, books and all that sort of thing as well. So their passion, you can see, if we only had enough money, we could do that for all of the admitted slots, and we're working on it. Okay. Um, you know, before I mention Rod and ask him to stand up, I'd like to point out that this month is special in a lot of, lot of different ways. I believe it was in about this time, Steve might remember, uh, when we moved into these buildings on this hill for the first time. I think it was in mid-September, because it's everything that we've discovered. Olin is working on new ways of doing things, and as we were building the campus, we decided we would create a new process for doing this, which we called Almost in Time. And just about everything that Ola did was almost in time, including the campus, which wasn't quite ready when the students got here. And in a couple of weeks into the program, we eventually moved into the campus. And Rod was here when we were doing that. And Rod has been here ever since, and Rod has decided that there's more to life than Olin, something that a lot of us haven't figured out yet. And he's going to try that out as a new lifestyle um, beginning next summer. And we're really going to miss you, Rod. I'm, we'll say more about this later, but I just want you to know, take advantage of Rod while you have him. Okay? Um, we're f I know he's uncomfortable with me about this because he really does not like to have a lot said about his work. So I'm going to hear about this. At um, any rate, we have a committee set up, and this committee will be doing its work during the year. We have the same uh, search consultant that we had that brought us Michelle, that brought us uh, Tom, and uh, we have high hopes that we'll be able to bring in a successor for Rod, there will never be a replacement for Rod, but we hope there will be a successor for Rod that will be able to pick up the ball and move it down the field. Okay. Um, those of you who are students don't have to pay any attention to this slide. This is just a quick alert to people in the audience who are employed here who get their paychecks of one very important piece of news. There will be no cost increase for your health insurance this year. This is news. This is not common um, in other institutions just now. Uh, and there's a long story behind this. There will be a slight change in the provider, but we don't think there will be any disruption in your current service. It maintains the same structure to the program and so forth. You'll hear more about it from the HR office. But this no cost increase um, didn't just happen. It was the result of a lot of energy and effort put in, particularly by Steve Hanabury and his staff. So I want to thank Steve for his work on something called Ed Health, which is still an influential force in American higher education when it comes to benefits like this. So thank you, Steve. Now, Let's shift and look outside the Oval for a minute. What's happening in terms of Olin's place in the universe? Uh, first of all, starting a little closer than the universe, just our closest neighbors, Babson and Wellesley, we have this three-college collaboration which continues to grow. Um, the big change this year is that we have a new director of this um, collaboration, Jan Janice Yellen from Babson. Um, before we've had um, Adele Wolfson from Wellesley. And this is a, 
a prog program which we'll have to rotate around. I only bring that up because guess what's going to happen when Janice's term ends? Um, somebody from Olin probably will get nominated, so I'm just getting people to think about that. Probably be a couple of years down the road. Uh, we had our first retreat in June. 65 people attended. There's a new intercession project on sustainability. Uh, they've started a new enterprise called Practically Green. It's all three campuses are involved in, and as you can see, there are more things going on. Um, now, I2E2. Has everybody heard of I2E2? Is anybody not heard of I2E2? Good. Not many. A few students may be particularly new. I2E2 is our organization that faces the outside world and manages our external engagements and uh, helps Olin to be influential when working with other institutions who want to change and improve. Uh, it's a growing enterprise. It was begun less than three years ago. I believe it was in November of, of 2009 that it was created. And in that short period of time, we've had 175 different visiting institutions, who've, some of whom have come here for a day, others have come here for more than a week. Some of them come more than once, and Olin has been there, and we have partners that have been developed. Uh, as you can see, we've had increased K through 12 interest. So we began by thinking about other engineering schools. That grew to include other kinds of schools, like liberal arts colleges, universities. Uh, now it's including K through 12 institutions. The kinds of engagements that we have with these other institutions has also grown. There are more of them. There are longer engagements when we have them. And they're bigger in size in terms of the number of people that are involved. So Olin's influence is actually growing quite well. Uh, there are some new initiatives here that are likely to make this even more influential in the next year, including uh, this funding from John Abley's group, the Argosy Collaborative Faculty Exchange. And there's a new NSF REU site, which will for the first time use undergraduate students at Olin as being influential partners in managing this um, process of change in higher education. So we're very excited about that. Um, now, Olin has also been involved in um, explaining to the rest of the academic world what's happening here and why we think this kind of change is important in every other institution. So this is just a list, just since last February, of the invited sort of major keynote presentations from members of the Olin community. Um, they range from, you know, ASEE to, this is National Instruments Week, which is the group that has been very interested in, the other group that makes LabVIEW, this uh, software which is very important for our engineering program. And our Sailbot team was invited to give a, a, a keynote presentation there, which is available on the web. It's really an interesting talk. In addition to that, Olin's been uh, invited to play influential roles in other institutions, some of which you might recognize. Um, you know, like the White House, or um, Harvard, or uh, West Point. Um, and this is just a partial list. There are lots of others going on. And there's also been some major media coverage in just the last few months, um, in, including one of my favorites here, if you haven't seen this, the AMD uh, Next Gen Engineer Initiative video. Um, there's a 10-minute version of this, which has just come out over the summer. And if you haven't seen it, I think it's really cool. So if you go to YouTube and simply search for that, it'll bring you to this 10-minute um, video. Features a lot of Olin people in it, and then as well as MIT and National Academy of Engineering and others too. This is ranking season. Maybe you know that. Okay, we don't normally pay a lot of attention to rankings, but the rest of the world does, and we have no choice but to notice these things. And uh, so there's been quite a lot of attention given today to the fact that U.S. News and World Report just released the rankings for 2013, and Olin has come out number six. So last year at this time, we were number eight. Is, so it's a good thing that we went up, right? Um, this is an interesting survey. I think we've always talked about this before. It's probably less going on here than meets the eye. Um, it's great to be in the top 10, but, you know, I, this isn't the kind of thing that I would 
die if we went down to number eight again next year. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm really also happy about the fact that in 13 different categories in Princeton Review, we were ranked in the top 20. And this is the, the other ranking which deals with student surveys rather than surveys of deans of schools. And in that survey, uh, our program is frequently recognized for the quality of the academic experience and the quality of the teaching in our faculty. You might remember last year we had three of our faculty members who were identified by Princeton Review as among the top 300 in the U.S. in uh, teaching. We were just thrilled with that. So at least the recognition is great. Now, I'm almost through. Um, upcoming events. This is going to be a busy fall. We have a lot of things happening in just the next six weeks or so. There's a reunion for the class of 2007. Is a special guest, but all other alumni are also invited in uh, September. There is um, the fall open house for a recruiting effort, same weekend. ABET visit, same weekend. We believe in sort of maximizing the pain. You know, just do it all at once. Um, <laughs> staying on that theme, we did that the next time, too. On October 26th through 28th, we have family weekend. We also have a Board of Trustees meeting and a President's Council meeting. And then we have this very special Decade One celebration that's going on on October 27th. So we can do them all at the same time. Very exciting. And as I looked at this, it struck me that October 27 is a very interesting day. In fact, it's a special day for my family, okay? That's the first birthday of the first grandchild in our family. And there he is, he's, he's, he's already very much at home in my office, it turns out. Um, so in summary, Olin students and alumni are soaring. We could not be more proud of what you are up to. Um, the academic reputation and influence of the school continues to grow. It's, in fact, stretching our calendar. It's very hard to keep up with the invitations. When, you, when we do this thing again in February, you'll find that the list of calendared opportunities to interact with other patients is even longer than the list that I just showed you today. So this is an accelerating process. The decline in the endowment value is a concern. Again, so I'm sure you'll hear more about this as the, as the year goes on. But the visibility and the new investments, particularly from our development program, from our alumni, are raising our spirits and raising our hopes for an even bigger year this year than we had last year. So let me thank you because it's your college and it's your actions and activities that have made all of this happen. I want to thank you for all that you do. And I want any questions that you might have. Actually, I'll I'll defer most of the questions to the experts.